Thank you to the organizers for asking me here to speak. This is my first HPC user forum, and I've had a, a very interesting and knowledge-filled time so far, I think. Uh, I've learned a lot. But just to give you some context of uh, my background and where I'm coming from, uh, I'm working for TAC in the Life Science Computing Group, and they have me stationed out in Houston, where I actually interact with users from uh, medical schools out there, from other UT system institutions. Uh, principally, it's MD Anderson Cancer Center, uh, UT Health Houston, UT Medical Branch Galveston, Texas Children's Hospital, Rice University, and Baylor College of Medicine. So at TAC, we have a lot of users from these uh, six institutions. And there's enough interest, they wanted some, some FaceTime with a real person. In Houston, oftentimes, uh, as Melissa put it yesterday, oftentimes uh, acting as a handholder, getting researchers on the machines, mostly life science researchers. And I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable saying disparaging things about the handholding needed by life science researchers because I, I am one of those life science researchers myself. Uh, so I'm perfectly comfortable saying that. Just to give uh, sort of a very high level overview about what I'm going to talk about, uh, at TAC, <clears throat> we ask ourselves every day, how do the users actually use the resources that we provide them? And building on that, how can we help them? What tools can we provide to help them use the resources more easily? Uh, this is particularly important for life science users that are coming from uh, varying degrees of background, varying degrees of HPC experience, uh, varying de degrees of expectations. And especially we need to look at the domains. Uh, we're seeing a huge uptick in data generation, uh, of course in genomics, but basically everywhere else in the clinic. Everyone's got data now, what do we do with all this data? And the application I'm gonna talk about today is this automated real-time MRI project, which falls in the precision medicine uh, field. So Melissa Fratkin yesterday did a pretty good overview, a very good overview of what we do at TAC. Uh, I want to add a couple things to it, so I won't go over the top points again. But if you look at all of our systems, we have maybe about 15 very large systems. The number of users that log in to one of these systems per month on the command line is about eight to 10,000, about eight to 10,000 unique users per month. And so when you look at, however, uh, other means of interfacing with our systems via, for example, web portals, that number is closer to 20 to 30,000 users per month. This, uh, when I learned this, this was shocking. And this actually goes back to the talk from, from Karen uh, from Ohio. Uh, where we are seeing a big uptick in users that want to interact with the machines in a non-conventional way. I myself am also perfectly happy with the command line, and I typically interact via the command line, but that is not really a solution uh, for everybody. And we have users coming from, uh, primarily it's UT Austin for us, but it's the rest of UT system, all six medical schools in UT system, uh, they're coming from the NSF Exceed network, so all over the country. There, we have a lot of international collaborators, and we have a lot of industry partners. So we have people coming from every walk of life. So <clears throat> this is the part of the talk where I make a sweeping declaration, and you can choose to agree with it or disagree with it, and we can argue about it later. But I want to declare that uh, any scientific application that you can run on a command line you can wrap it up into an API and deliver that application as a service to a user through a web portal. So I put the word almost in here because uh, only, not everyone deals in absolutes. Only Siths deal in absolutes, some might say. But uh, I, I do firmly believe that really any scientific application that you want to deliver to your user, you can wrap it up in a web portal so they don't need to learn the command line. The way we do this at TAC is through one of our homebrew APIs called Agave. And this has really been super, super helpful in us to reach more users and uh, deliver services in a, a very easy way. So the, you know, again, a little bit more technical, 
Agave is a RESTful API, so that's a set of uh, rules and tools where uh, you can interact with the web to issue certain commands. And this was developed at TAC under uh, NSF and NIH support, originally under a, a grant called Cybers, uh, but now it's, it's gotten along further, far enough that it has procured its own funding as well. And I've listed at the bottom here a few uh, uh, bullets of if you're thinking, is Agave right for me? Do I need to wrap up my application in a web, in a web portal using Agave? Uh, you can ask yourself some of these questions. Do you want to reach more users who don't like the command line interface or they don't like to log in with SSH? Do you want to uh, develop standards, practices, uh, uh, protocols that have high reproducibility? This is especially important in most scientific labs. Do you want to reduce the complexity of really long pipelines and workflows? Uh, most, most people would say yes to that, I think. And do you want to share products from your group? Say your group develops an application. Do you want to share that more easily with someone else? Uh, Agave might be the right tool. So I, I'm going to give a quick example because it, it's kind of hard to understand Agave without seeing an example. So I'm just going to give a quick example. And then I'm going to show how we use this in a clinic, you doing MRI. Uh, but this example, we have a portal attack. It's called the Drug Discovery Portal. And what it does is in, in drug discovery, uh, you oftentimes you'll have a, a protein structure that you've downloaded from Protein Data Bank. And you have a library of several hundred thousand small molecules that you want to test if they fit inside your protein. If it fits better, it's more likely going to bind and it's more likely going to be a possible drug candidate. So what you do is you do a process called virtual screening. And most of us will log in the command line, we'll install the software that we want to use, we'll uh, run the job, we'll do batch job submission to our cluster. But, you know, that's difficult. And most organic chemists and synthetic chemists and medicinal chemists, they don't want to do that. What they want to do is they want to come to a website shown here they want to log in with their TAC credentials, and they want to click a couple boxes. They click a box, upload their protein structure, click a box to select a library to screen, hit enter, and then behind the scenes what's happening is Agave takes that input, it submits a batch job for them on their behalf on one of our systems, Lone Star for example. It uses the application that they want to use. In this example, it's a Linux application called Autodoc that does virtual screening. And then when that is done, it just returns the results right back into this web portal, and you can download it with a click, a couple more clicks. No, go ahead now. That so it's it's perfectly flexible. It's all in Agave. Agave can handle any type of uh, uh, it can handle Slurm, LSF. Okay. So we've hard-coded a lot of that. Say they pick a library that we expect to take 24 hours on 96 cores, then we'll hard-code that. That combination of, of choices they made automatically chooses a 96-core job, for example. So a lot of it's hard-coded behind the scenes, but it's perfectly flexible to the developer, how you want to define the system and how you want to define the application. That you, this one in particular does not, but yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So using web interfaces like this, uh, this really gives us the opportunity to reach a lot more users, get them on our systems, running jobs. And, and I said earlier that uh, instead of eight to 10,000 users per month on the command line, we're seeing 20 to 30,000 unique users per month coming in and touching attack computer uh, through web portals. Uh, that's really an astounding number to me. And so what I'm going to talk about is a collaboration that I have with a group at UT Health in Houston. It's a radiologist who's doing MRI, and they needed a solution uh, to a challenging problem they had, and I helped them figure it out. So MRI, super, we all know MRI, uh, extremely valuable tool. Uh, pick your favorite uh, TV, medical drama, and you've seen the pictures, you know, you see a person go in the tube and you got the little fishbowl next door where the scientists are sitting at computers and watching through the big glass window. Uh, this is MRI. Uh, it's immensely useful. It's, it's been around 30-some years now. 
immensely useful in prognosis and treatment of patients. But what it lacks is uh, real-time answers. You know, you'll see in your favorite TV medical drama that, bam, they have this beautiful picture up on the screen right away, and they say, oh, you know, your tumor has grown or shrunk exactly this amount. Th that's not how it actually is. You know, we need to do MRI, we call the patient in, we uh, take the scans, we get a lot of data, the patient goes home, then when the technician or the radiologist or the postdoc has time later, they go on the computer, do the calculations. They, uh, oftentimes, it's, it's very uh, manual what they do. And it takes time. And you know, sometimes the other thing they discover, too, is that uh, some of the scans, the, the data they've gathered, may be uh, corrupted. And what they'll have to do then is call the patient back in, schedule a new appointment. This wastes time and treatment. This wastes money. You know, these scanners are booked 12 hours a day, almost. When I worked on it, it was uh, really hard to find time to get in there and do our testing because it's just booked all the time. Um, and this also makes it very hard to do precision medicine in MRI. Uh, precision medicine in MRI is tuning the parameters you use when you take a scan to be customized to that patient. So right now, what, if you've had an MRI yourself before, they'll load you in the tube and they'll take an average patient uh, uh, set of scan parameters to scan you. And for the most part, that's fine. But if they tune the parameters to match you specifically, uh, they, they can come out with some better outcomes. And so what this lab, they approached us and they said, OK, we have a scanner. It gathers data. But we want to process on that data fast so that we can make real-time decisions in patient care, in tuning parameters to provide better scans. And so how do we take a scanner and hook it up to one of your supercomputers and do this iteratively in real time while the patient's still there before they go home for the day? And I already hit on some of these, but there are a lot of challenges to this. Um, some, some groups have, have tried this before, and they'll buy hardware. They'll uh, put it in the lab, but then now you have to hire another person, or you have to count on your radiologist, or you have to count on your technician to maintain that hardware, to buy new hardware when it goes out of date. Um, you know, this hardware then, it's almost never used. You know, it, it's only used when patients are in there for very short bursts of time. It is inefficient. You waste a lot of potential clock cycles. And there's a lot of human error. Well, I, this goes actually back to the video we just saw. There's a lot of potential for human error when you're the technician and you get some data and maybe, I don't know, you put it on a jump drive and you go over to the little cluster, pop it in. Uh, because it goes without saying, these MRI computers, they're not hooked up to the internet. <laughs> that, that would be a pipe dream if you know, the, these MRI computers could, could do more than they actually can. But no, you're, you're popping it on a thumb drive walking it over to the cluster, popping it in, starting the analysis pipeline. There's just lots of things that could go wrong, and it's slow. Um, one critical thing we really needed to make this work was cooperation from a vendor. And so that's been a huge theme that I've seen talked about today is uh, industry cooperation. And Philips, who's the manufacturer of our MRI scanner, they worked with us really closely, and they were super helpful in getting us to um, sort of hack the scanner software so that could automate some of these processes for us. So just briefly, uh, the approach that we use, and like I said, we, we wrap most of this up with a tool called Agave, but we had uh, three different compute systems. We had three different major uh, software applications, and it's about a four-step process, so I'm going to just briefly touch on each of these. So so that you're aware, the three compute systems we have here, the MRI scanner, it is itself attached to a computer. It's an old version of Windows. It, you can't update it. It's not connected to the internet. It itself poses lots of problems. Uh, but we could connect it to a network, like a little LAN, a, a network area file system. And so doing that enabled us to get it to talk to what's next to it, this proxy server. And this server is just a small standard uh, Windows machine in the lab, in the same uh, room as the scanner itself, actually. And so then the final piece of hardware is the cloud system. This is where we actually do the processing of the data. 
And for this, we actually started on Stampede, and we were doing great stuff on there. We liked it. Uh, but then we moved to Jetstream uh, just for more flexibility. It's nice to have road access to the machines. Uh, it's nice to be able to elastically expand and decrease the number of cores you need that day. And of course, Jetstream is the NSF uh, funded distributed system between TAC and Indiana. So just a bit about the software we use. Uh, the scanner comes with its own software. We have almost no control over that software, but we were able to convince Philips, the manufacturer, to, to sort of open it up and hack the scanner API a little bit for us just so that it could uh, send data to the proxy server for us. And Agave, again, this is that RESTful API. It wraps up both the proxy server uh, and the cloud system. And so it's able to do everything from shuttle data back and forth uh, to executing jobs. And that's the, really the key part here. It talks to the cloud system for us and it runs our analysis pipeline. And then our analysis pipeline, finally, is this tool called Grape. I'll talk about this a tiny bit at the end. This is just for MRI analysis. And so what the workflow looks like now is that you have a, a patient physically, they're laying in the scanner. Uh, you hit go on the scan. The scans usually take about five minutes. And at the very end of the scan, the scanner software, it senses that the scan is done and it triggers a series of events. Uh, the first event, what it does is it pushes the output data to the proxy server and executes a shell script on the proxy server. And that shell script, what it does is it wraps up all the agave commands. It goes, does everything from it uh, de-identifies the data, it tars and zips the data into a single package, it pushes that to Jetstream, it executes Grape, waits for Grape to finish, and as soon as Grape is finished, then part three here, agave pulls the data back to the proxy server, and then uh, it unzips it and does some checks to make sure things are right. And finally, it pushes the data back to the scanner and adds it to a, to a scanner database so that the clinician can like click on and see the outcome. So here's an example. And we spent a lot of time developing this. You know, it was easy for me to say what it does, but it took us a while to figure out how to get there. And we just had the first patient you know, do this in real time about three weeks ago. It was a 32-year-old woman who presented with uh, hip issues. And so we were able to run the platform twice, her left hip, then her right hip. And uh, the specific type of scan that we did on her is called T1 fitting. I don't need to go into detail, but basically you're looking at the hip. And the outcome of each of these uh, scans, it's actually, what is this, seven consecutive scans are... Uh, pretty big, it's not huge data, but what it is, it's 384 by 384 by about 30 voxels, which are 3D pixels, and so it's, it's two, three million points, and you have that seven times. And what you're doing with this pipeline is you're taking all of those and you're computing an average, and then from the average you get a better image. And so this is actually what happens uh, in real time. And this is what it looks like when you're sitting in the scanner room. Is so we begin uh, on the left, the scanner, it takes about 300 seconds to scan the patient. And as soon as that stops, you have you know, your, your non-averaged image, you have just a generic image. Uh, but as soon as it stops, it pushes that data to the proxy server and Agave takes over. Uh, it de-identifies, it compresses, it uploads, uh, and then it begins the process of job submission. And we actually have quite a bit of overhead here. It's about 40 seconds right now. And that doesn't s seem like a super long time, but you're sitting there in the fishbowl, uh, like on your laptop, looking at Jetstream, and you have a patient right behind you in the tube, and you're thinking, oh boy, this, this is the longest 40 seconds of my day, and it's, you're just hoping everything goes smoothly. And once that begins, Grape starts to run on Jetstream here, this is that analysis pipeline. Uh, it combines all those images into an average, pushes the data back to the proxy server, which then pushes the data back to the scanner, and that's the end. So total, that was about 120 seconds. It's a little long. Uh, we want to shorten it. We have some strategies we're going to use to shorten this. But the end result, 
Uh, a minute, 20 seconds after the scan concludes, you have this nice, uh, better image back on the scanner. And again, this was fully automated. I didn't click any buttons. I didn't uh, push, uh, push any buttons. I uh, just let it go and it, it ran itself. Here's one other example uh, that is kind of nice. It's a little more complex because this one requires two different scans as input. Uh, so without going into a lot of detail, the first scan runs and it actually kicks off the job submission process and kicks off GRAPE, uh, the analysis pipeline. And then here the patient is just resting a little bit between scans. And as soon as the second scan begins, it already eats up that overhead because you don't have to submit another job. You're actually just uploading the data again. And then as soon as GRAPE sees that the rest of the data is there, then it continues to process and finishes the pipeline. So in this perspective, the patient waited a minute and 10 seconds for um, this, this specific analysis. And the other great thing about, uh, what I think is great about uh, TAC is that we don't just offer these uh, systems to people. We don't just offer Agave and the tools to people. Uh, we wanna work with them to make their code uh, faster and more efficient and amenable to our resources. And so some of the things we did include hacking uh, uh, their grape application a little bit so that if not all the data was present, what it does is it enters this pending or waiting mode. So it's actually still running on Jetstream but just waiting for the rest of the data to arrive. And we also helped them parallelize their code. As we said, there's no single core computers. There's no excuse not to have parallel code now. So the, to summarize, um, you know, I think most of the people here are uh, uh, industry, some academics, some national labs. I don't know who is going to have interactions with clinicians, but it's really important to get in there and talk to them and understand their needs and then work with them to a solution because what I did here with uh, this MRI lab, there was nothing, it's not exascale, it's not, you know, any really fancy software. Uh, it's all just commodity stuff. It's all pretty much free stuff. Uh, they're not paying for any of it. Um, it's just having the right people in the room at the right time to come up with the solution that uh, was really valuable in this case. And it's important when you're working with clinicians too to think about uh, PHI, uh, preserving and protecting patient confidentiality. And as I said before, it's sometimes hard to get to work on a scanner. Um, and this probably goes for other medical devices as well. And then one last thing I want to uh, leave with is, as I have a couple seconds left, is that, that picture I showed, everything in there is perfectly modular. This doesn't have to be MRI. This could be any device that writes data to a computer and it's hooked up to a network. Uh, it doesn't have to be Stampede or Jetstream. It could be your lab server. It could be any supercomputer. And it doesn't have to be Grape. That's just the application we use for this to process the data. But it can be any application. Agave can wrap up any application. And so a lot of this work was done in concert with uh, Dr. Rafat Gaber at UT Health. He's a radiologist. And uh, I'd just like to take a second to acknowledge him. And I'll take your questions. And thank you for your attention. So a couple of questions. One, yes. um, did you have to go through FDA approval for this as well? Because if you're going through clinics. And then the other one is how transferable is the agave? So can I just download agave, run it at my site, bring something up like that? Because I've been doing very similar stuff. So uh, they previously had IRB approval, not FDA, but IRB approval to scan these patients. And the only change is that it's, we are um, processing the data in a different way, and the IRB wording was general enough that we didn't have to make any changes to the IRB. So there, there, we didn't go through any other extra steps. And for your second question, uh, yeah, Agave is completely free and open source. Uh, trying to install your own instance of Agave is gonna be uh, daunting, and I would not recommend it. 
But if you go to this website, cybers.org, uh, this is not a bad place to start where you can see some examples of uh, application, and this is all free to see some examples of applications wrapped up in agave and running on our supercomputers. So that, that's a good place to start. Yeah. I'm just wondering, I, I, and you mentioned radiologists, and I, before you mentioned, I was wondering how they feel about that and what their place is in the whole loop compared to before. So the Ray Fogg Gaber is a radiologist, and he was the one who decided, I need to hook this up. This was his idea. And I, I was just the guy you that... that more than one radiologist in the world. Okay. Um, I mean, we haven't really presented this to a lot of radiologists before. Uh, I think where this is really going to come to use is in things like automated image registration and automated segmentation. Because you'll have patients squirm around a little bit, and you need to take the resulting images and align them. And then you need to identify the tumor and draw a circle around it to calculate its volume. And that is tedious and requires a lot of compute power. And uh, radiologists typically do that by hand. But with machine learning algorithms, uh, automated image segmentation is becoming a lot more reliable. And it'd be great to have a patient pop into, a, pop into one of the MRI tubes, have them come out, and then we have the answer waiting for them. They say, hey, your tumor is 30% smaller or 30% bigger uh, my, right my then. Real question was, does the radiologist still get to use his or her education? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. of course, of course, yeah. It, it's, uh, it's a nice supplement, not a replacement for existing, yeah. So why doesn't Philips just package this into a local unit attached to their MRI? Uh, they haven't thought to do it yet. And, okay. and then the question is, who maintains that unit? Uh, who pays it, for it? Who administers it? Who wears the automation? There, so there's a lot of uh, comparts to this that, you know, the, the, how long is it going to take before the software is, or the hardware is out of date? On, uh, I can't say, so... In the future, without saying things I'm not supposed to say, but Knight's Landing, we know the ZM5, they're a perfect set of hardware for uh, image processing tasks. And at TAC, we've got more ZM5s than we know what to do with. And so the, this is going to very soon in the very near future be part of uh, what we're doing here. Yeah. And I. I so if Philips is, I don't think Philips is out here, but if Philips is out here and they want to start buying some ZN5s and hook them up to the MRI scanner, you know, that great, the patients need it, yeah. Quick, quick question, how many, on a, on a system like Jetstream, yes. how many simultaneous MRI systems could you support? So Jetstream is only a few thousand, uh, I'm actually not sure how many, cores it has total, but it's, just, it's a very elastic cloud system. And we're only using, for this test case, it was really a toy example. We were using eight cores. And when we get into something more complicated like automated image registration and image segmentation, we're going up to 96 cores real fast. And then eventually we're maybe going to have some access to Knight's landing and you know have several of those. Um, in terms of like how many people could do this simultaneously, it's just dependent on the hardware. But Jetstream is, is completely replaceable. You could have a 96-core server installed at your house and pop it in to this pipeline and have Agave speak to that server at your house and do the processing there. But then, then there's an extra challenge of you'd have to administer and maintain that. And doing it on a NSF-sponsored computer takes that uh, obligation out of the hands of the radiologists, which is part of our uh, intent here. One back there. Uh, just a, a question and then maybe a comment. The radiologist, why did he really like this? What did he tell you? What did he, why did he like it? Why did he like this? I think he liked it because it was his idea and he finally saw it in fruition. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the comment, though, I, I live out in Utah in the West, right? And there are a lot of people who have to wait to get MRIs done and get CAT scans done. Yeah. And for treatments and to have them receive, you know, a treatment that they can follow. Uh, it would be great 
if this could be replicated in a smaller way and made it commoditized so that people can get it where they need it. And even if it is connected over a secure web link, right, the people at distant locations who don't have those facilities nearby, I, I could see this doing fantastic. So thank you. Thank you for your comment. Yeah. So what are the implications for what you need to do to your HPC when you're now handling HIPAA and PI and, and things like that? Yeah, that, that's a huge headache. But what we do is we de-identify it on site. We de-identify it as it leaves a scanner. And then, then it's just image data. And we can put it on Jetstream and not worry about any patient information getting out. So that's what we do right now. So uh, my question, maybe is slightly related to that last one, is uh, an MRI machine is a medical device. Medical devices are regulated by the FDA. Um, in order to uh, have this actually be productized to be able to be used on a regular basis would require going through the whole medical device validation process and so on, which, by the way, requires that every result that you've created uh, can be reproduced. Mm which means if you run it on a cloud service, you have to be able to demonstrate that you ran it on exactly the same software stack, no differences in libraries and things like that. So yeah. if it's all done in a container or something like that, that might work. Yes. But uh, you know, the, the other side of this process, I mean, it's, it, you know, the, the idea of getting those results a lot faster has a real clinical benefit. But from a pr the practical standpoint of getting a new clinical device Yes. to market is highly non-trivial. So I, and I, I am 100% in agreement with the statement you just made. Uh, and I am in a fortunate position of not having to deal with any of that. I am. <laughs> right. So. Isn't research <laughs> wonderful? <laughs> yes. So I, I live in this, you know, I've been academic all my life. And I don't have a lot of experience or any experience with industry. And uh, so I'm blissfully agnostic to anything of you, that you just brought up. But no, the, we've actually had this a similar discussion with the radiologist and his uh, chair involved in the project. And I, they are aware of the, the technical challenges. And uh, in terms of the cloud system, everything basically is containerized. So it is a reproducible image that we're using. Mm -hmm. Okay, Joe, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.